How are you, Mario? Fine. How are you? It's lovely to see you. <laughs> Even your your tiny little square on my screen. Hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's great to see you. What time is it there? Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Yeah. So you might see some more light in the room. Who knows if the sun rises today? So. Okay. Good. We'll give it a couple of minutes just to get people. Yeah. No worries. I can see the numbers going up. Okay, I think we're good to go. Um, welcome everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Can you nod, those of you that have a camera, uh, if you can hear me, perfect. Um, my name is Mario Novelli. I'm the director of the Center for International Education and the co-PI of the Peer Network. Um, welcome to everybody. 
uh, to week two of the Peer Network Lecture Series, The Political Economy of Education in Times of Conflict, Crisis and Pandemic, uh, a GCRF AHRC funded network between the Centre for International Education, the University of Sussex, uh, the University of Cape Town, Nazarbayev University, Kazakhstan and the University of Ulster, Northern Ireland. Uh, which aims to promote engagement with the critical political economy, analysis of education in contexts of conflict and crisis. Um, the lecture is also supported by UGFIET, the UK Forum on International Education and Training. All of these lectures will be live, live streamed through YouTube and available afterwards and will become part of a free online open resource uh, for all those interested in learning and sharing knowledge and practice about the political economy of education. Today's session is led by uh, Dr. Prachi Srivastava uh, from Western University, Ontario, um, Canada, and is focused on the politics of COVID-19 and education. Um, before I introduce her, I just want to briefly run through a few housekeeping rules and logistics. Um, firstly, um, please mute yourself uh, unless you're asking a question in the Q&A. Um, secondly, please uh, note down in the chat any questions uh, that you want to ask during the talk through the chat function. I will collate them and come back to back later uh, in the Q&A to request you, you ask the question. Um, Prachi will talk today for around 35 to 40 minutes. And then we will have a seven minute Sussex buzz in small breakout rooms so that you can reflect on the content of the lecture. We'll then come back as a group for a plenary Q&A. Um, we'll try to finish promptly around quarter past two UK time. Uh, so I'd just like to take the, a, a few seconds um, to introduce Dr. Prachi Srivastava. She's an associate professor at, the, at Western University, Ontario, Canada. Uh, in the Faculty of Education. She specializes in education and international development. She's a member of the World Bank Expert Advisory Council on citizen engagement. Previously, she has served with the United Nations Mission in Kosovo and the International Rescue Committee. She holds a doctorate from the University of Oxford. Uh, currently, Prachi is working on, a global, uh, on the global education emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, hence the lecture today. She's She's leading a high level policy brief for the T20 task force on COVID-19, which will feed into the G20 summit. And she has also provided recommendations uh, for the Ontario Ministry of Education based on this work uh, and has been very active across social media, um, raising a range of issues of the challenges and the relationship between education and the current COVID uh, pandemic. We are very happy to welcome you to this peer lecture and also to thank you very much for getting up so early in the morning <laughs> to us. I know that uh, in Ontario, it's 8 a.m. now. Uh, so we really appreciate that. And uh, the Zoom is yours. I will just stop my share and pass on to you. Hi, everyone. Um, lovely to see so many names that I recognize and a little bit daunting because you'll be listening to what I have to say at this time. Um, I think I'm not sure if Mario already knew I'm not I'm not a great early bird. So this is really um, different to be up and ready at this time. But I'm so thrilled to be here and lovely to see so many of my colleagues. For those of you who don't know, um, I used to uh, be a lecturer at the Center for International Education at Sussex, and it kind of feels a little bit like coming home, even though I'm still um, far away here. Um, so thank you again, Mario, for inviting me. Uh, I am going to start sharing my screen, um, and then I will get into talking a little bit more. Okay, that's weird. Yeah, there we go. So um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit on um, what we've discussed in terms of the um, COVID-19 scenario. Um, can you tell me, can you actually see my screen? Is that all right? It's, it's minimized though, I know. And if I do this, can you see my talk? No. Okay. That's good. Um, so I'm I'm doing a, something a little bit different today, which is I have a bit of a prepared talk um, because a lot of the issues that I'll be discussing in my mind are conceptual. 
And what I want to do is actually bring our attention a little bit to some of the underlying assumptions that are framing the discourse around uh, COVID-19 and education globally. Um, and for that, I just find it easier to actually have a prepared talk rather than kind of um and ah through it. So those are a little bit of the presentation, um, uh, kind of the way that the presentation will go today. And I apologize if you uh, prefer slides. Um, there's kind of another issue around that as well, which is for me, this is a bit of a private lecture in a very public space, and it will be able to be accessed across time and space. And so, extracting snippets, snippets out of for all of us, who are, you know, context right now. It's really a, a complete that we are working in right now. Um, if there are questions at any point, please do raise them in the chat box and I'll be very happy to answer them. I'll also, I'm also happy to receive emails and I'm on, I'm active on Twitter. So if you have questions, feel free to, um, to speak with me on social media as well. So as um, Mario has explained and introduced since March, I've been working on the education, the global education emergency caused by COVID-19 globally and domestically in Canada. Globally, I've really have been focusing a lot on the G20 response and leading that brief um, for a special tax task force on COVID-19. Uh, domestically, I've been focusing on Ontario, which has the second highest cases in Canada and which is the most populous province. It's one of our richest provinces as well. And so what I have been doing um, on that is kind of trying to mobilize some policy action. And I've also created a school dashboard that will link the COVID school related cases to, social, um, to school level so socioeconomic data to give a better understanding of the potential equity effects in terms of which schools are being affected. It's going to be released in the next week. And right now it's like the biggest happiness thrill of my life in terms of working on this because it feels like something real and concrete that we can contribute. But all these activities have brought to, to the foreground the inextricable role of politics, big P and small P in steering the pandemic and the global education emergency. Big P politics or simply the macro systems and activities of decision-making and governance, the formal institutions or rules, and the multitude of actors involved in mitigating and mediating those activities and systems. So that's what I'm talking about when we're talking big P politics. And of course, small P politics, the codified unstructured norms and micro norms that structure and guide those decisions or facilitate inaction and their interplay with the big P systems, institutions and actors. The way the big P and small P are playing out in the education pandemic response remind us that no matter how much reductive, technicist, or quote unquote objective discourse has been used to characterize education and the processes of education governance, particularly over the last 20 or 30 years, and you know, using discourse of evidence and expertise, and of course the increased intermingling of state and non-state interests, Fundamentally, education is and will remain a deeply political sphere. It defines us. <laughs> it defines us as individuals and as, and as a collective. It is, in essence, reflective of our values, our ambitions. It is a systemized collection of what our societies privilege, who they privilege, how, and on what terms. On a very relatable level, we know this. As a concerned citizen, a student, or a researcher, we, over the last many months, experienced that the responses to the pandemic and the global education emergency are far from apolitical. They are imbued with a certain action or inaction, a legitimization or delegitimization of evidence and science and knowledge. The responses speak volumes about whose futures and lives and opportunities we value and whose we do not. I will first off, uh, I will first start off by characterizing the context of the emergency and then delve into more of a conceptual expose, highlighting many of the role, mainly the role of the underlying assumptions in framing the current context for education and the pandemic. 
So many of you must have been monitoring or some of you must have been monitoring the school closures as they occurred. And this, um, this slide really just takes some um, of the uh, work that had been um, monitoring work that had been done by UNESCO and in, 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 in terms of monitoring the school closures. And I found it to be very useful and also very telling. Um, for those of us who are um, following the pandemic and education, it is no exaggeration to say that we are witnessing the most severe crisis in education we have experienced in modern history. The impact of which will affect ent an entire generation, the full consequences of which we will not know for at least one full education cycle or more simply a generation. The first phase of the pandemic was characterized by near universal policy response in the form of countrywide school closures. And you can see that on this map. More than 190 countries instituted countrywide closures and there were localized school, country, uh, school closures in six countries. This affected roughly 1.6 or 1.7 billion learners. That number represents roughly 97% of the total population of children and youth, if you use the world population data, and 90% of learners, according to UIS data. This is roughly a fifth of humanity on our planet. That number, I think, is, you know, for all of us working in this, is just completely staggering. Now, of course, we know that with school closures, there are severe effects. This slide outlines some of them learning loss and dropout, physical and sexual abuse, increased underage pregnancies, mental health and psychosocial impacts, reduced emotional support, loss of essential services. Of course, schools are not just a place for education and learning, formal education and learning. They also provide a hub of services. And a lot of these services are accessed by our most vulnerable communities. There are compounded effects on the vulnerable and marginalized groups of those from lower income backgrounds, children with special needs, excluded communities, of course, girls in low income and low middle income countries, and those affected by vulnerable circumstances and by crisis and conflict that already were affecting about 260 million children before we started the pandemic. So the pandemic essentially has laid bare the extent to which most education systems were unprepared for crisis and crisis sensitive planning. Earlier in my career, as Mario mentioned, I actually started working in education in conflict affected contexts. And I saw the, the dissonance in many of our systems in the, with the inability to deal with what we had been thrust into. In many contexts, particularly in high income countries of the quote unquote West or North, education systems have been operating in silos for many years. This leads to a disconnect from knowledge, resources and expertise. It provides a buffer for ministries and departments to act in isolation or not to act with relative ease. I'll come back to um, this inaction and I'll come back to how it is facil facilitated by one of the underlying assumptions of the discourse. So regardless of the closures and regardless of the fact that the pandemic has interrupted regular formal provision of education, the unalienable right to education remains. And for many of us here, we've been working on the right to education for years. We, we, we buy into or take very strongly the assumption that states are the principal duty bearers under international human rights law to respect, fulfill, protect uh, the right to education. And the crisis actually highlights the centrality of these obligations. The crisis should actually compel us to demand that our states act in those ways. You can see on this slide, that in terms of um, the obligations concerning the right to education, um, education in all its forms and all its levels should be available, accessible, acceptable, and adaptable. These obligations do not change when we enter crisis or emergency, and in fact, they are heightened. Oops. But the ability of countries to enact their obligations will be affected by capacity issues. And they will also be affected by their situations when they entered the pandemic. 
And this is very strongly related to capacity, supply, and financing issues that characterized education systems when we entered the pandemic, new pandemic-related compulsions, and the level of crisis preparedness that systems had in place. Pre-existing institutional education systems and in, um, institutional education systems inequities are crucial in this regard. These include inadequate and inequitable domestic and international education financing, under or presumed lower quality supply, and capacity issues inhibiting the implementation of necessary measures. This, I would argue, really depends on the context, but in every system, there are issues which we were dealing with uh, pre-existing to the pandemic, which will be heightened and new issues that will appear. We are at this point beginning to see education policy sway. In many countries, uh, we just entered a new academic year. What does that mean? So while the first responses were nearly universal, policy sway is contextual and will be contextual. It will, however, be fragmented, it will be volatile. Some systems will continue to institute blunt, open, closed strategies of their systems. Others will be more nuanced and localized. Now, this is where we get into some of the more conceptual questions. And this is where I kind of stopped with the slides. So you're gonna have to just look at my animated face um, if that's okay. Um, and I'm gonna stop screen share. Mario, is that all right with you? Okay, so. Yes, perfect. Great. If you don't hear me at any point, Mario, just jump in because I'm not really watching the screen anymore. Okay, thank you. So what are some of the concerns that are driving this policy sway? I argue that short-term economic incentives and crude efficiencies are driving education policy sway. We are relying on a severe and uncritical, um, we, are, we are on a severe and uncritical over-reliance on what I referred to in an earlier paper as the mobilizing frame of scarce resources. And we are, and we are seeing globally an, in, an unwillingness to, to invest in the areas that we need to. These are particularly difficult to justify in some contexts. Um, and in some contexts, they might be more legitimate. But in contexts like Canada, where I currently sit, it is really hard to justify. So the very, there are also very severe and real insecurities which pose greater risk to life and well-being in certain countries, um, and especially in countries with larger informal economies, more restricted social safety nets. Um, some of the other illnesses may be much more compelling, the collapse of the economies and how this is going to affect one or two generations may be much more compelling. But I argue that we cannot assess education policy sway in, in the time of the pandemic without first considering the underlying assumptions framing the education emergency caused by COVID. And why? Why do I say that? Because our guiding assumptions are critical in framing knowledge, in framing systems and their governance, in framing systems of knowledge. That is our education systems. These assumptions frame what we think is worthy. They frame who is worthy to be fully inserted in those systems and on what terms, what the purpose of those systems are, who will shape them and who will not, for what purposes, for whom, and how. At every point, assumptions guide our decisions. They shape our systems. They structure complex social phenomena which characterize and make understandable our daily lived experiences. When woven together, these assumptions form the meta-narrative characterizing the form and function of our education systems. In this case, the context of the pandemic and towards recovery. Assumptions can be dangerous because they may be incomplete, uncritical, or colonial. They can mute certain voices. But if inclusive and consciously critical, think here of Paulo Freire's con conscientization, they can provide a reorienting framework, the capacity to reimagine education and its role in society and recovery. And that part is really exciting. So here I turn to a little bit of postmodern theory, just a little bit, just bear with me. 
Meta narratives, a concept that was derived by the postmodern perspective of Lyotard, are the totalizing expl explanations, the grand theories used to explain complex social phenomena. Their utility is attractive because they reduce the complexity of otherwise disparate, fractious, and intricate ideas, events, and phenomena into seemingly comprehensive explanations that signal universal truths or values. Meta narratives render complexities comprehensible. They are, in the truest sense of the term, discursive. They rely on discourse. Their legitimacy is accepted by propagating dominant discourse. And that discourse rests on seemingly neutral assumptions. When critically analyzed, the assumptions favor the interests of maintaining established power structures. There is, of course, room for agency. There's room for agency in rejecting dominant or crafting new assumptions. However, this route is highly contested and is subject to broad-based delegitimization. So if you find yourself banging your head against a wall, you're probably trying to fight the dominant discourse. Now, what are some of the assumptions framing our starting points for COVID-19 and education? I have line three, and this is towards, now we're getting to the meaty part or towards almost the last third of the talk. First, the dangerous discourse that we simply do not know, that this pandemic has thrust the world into uncharted territory, which requires entirely new knowledge, new data, new evidence. Let's unpack that. Yes, the pandemic has brought on mass closures of systems globally in a way that no other modern event has. However, it is rather simplistic to say that we have no discourse of inaction, literature of an entire discipline of study. And, and we are here, we are part of that tradition. We have 50 or 60 years of modern literature and inequities, social cohesion. We have a range of global institutions that have produced, commissioned, and been at, at the forefront of knowledge, evidence, and data production to address education inequities and education and emergencies. We have an international global system on architecture. We have the SDGs. Previously, we had the, F the EFA goals and the MDGs. We have global task forces on teaching and learning, on metrics, on data. This assumption that we just do not know, and so we flounder, ignores the rich history of educational research and the discipline that can actually be reappropriated, be made more inclusive and applied to understand some aspects, some aspects of the effects on education. But, with, but, but by buying into those assumptions, we delay action or we justify inaction. It's the second assumption. The second is that the pandemic is a great equalizer, that we're all in this together. This was one of the first slogans of the pandemic in the earlier days. And it was a, a slogan that I heard uh, repeated in, in many contexts. Um, it was the idea that the pandemic doesn't discriminate, that it can affect everybody, young and old, rich and poor. But actually, we know that it does discriminate. There are data coming out. And actually, from the UK, the UK produced one of the earlier reports, the BAME report, in terms of the effects of the pandemic, which was highly contested and was almost suppressed. We know that the pandemic does discriminate. It will have more severe effects on certain populations, groups, and countries than it does on others. Certain inequities will harden. New ones will appear. Roughly, as we speak, it's estimated that 900 million children still have not returned to school due to pandemic closures or have returned in precarious circumstances. Some uh, might never return. We need to make sure that they are not silenced, that we, that we understand that we are in a vastly different world now when it comes to education than we were in February. And that education research and efforts must begin with those at the center, with them in the center. Third, what's the third assumption? The third is that simply having evidence will inform policy action. And those of us who are involved in, in, in trying to mobilize policy action know that this is manifestly not the case. 
all of us as citizens can see that the way that the macro responses to the pandemic have been enacted by certain governments has been highly political. The uptake of evidence is political. It can be couched in resource constraints, which may be more valid in some contexts than others, but it can also be ignored. It can be delegitimized in favor of other interests. And we need to be mindful of that. So finally, and I end with just three points, what do we do to move forward? I have three interrelated considerations. The first is that we began on a concerted effort to mobilize existing data, evidence, and knowledge. But that effort must be conscious and critical. It must re-examine knowledge that we already have in a more concerted, co cohesive way. Now, secondly, and interrelated, having said that there is existing knowledge, of course, there are limits. The precisions on the direct impact of the pandemic need to be investigated, centering on the already marginalized and vulnerable. Some effects will be much longer term, the magnitude of learning loss, for example, the nature of foregone life opportunities, the consequences on social mobility. Some will be more immediate. How are services being delivered and provided right now? What are the experiences of learners of the most vulnerable and marginalized and families right now? What are the immediate policy responses? And finally, third, we must re-examine which knowledge and evidence have been historically included into that quadra and which have been excluded. Where are the centers of knowledge production? Are these framed in a colonized um, understanding of knowledge and knowledge systems. We need a rapprochement of academic and grassroots and policy oriented researchers, particularly from the quote unquote global south and from colonized communities. Um, and we need a true opening of knowledge production. So I'm going to end there in terms of my formal presentation. I hope that you there is some food for thought. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to give me the opportunity to actually think about my own perceptions and my assumptions. And I'll hand the mic over back to Mario. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Prachi, for a very stimulating uh, presentation that raised a number of issues that I'm sure um, we can all uh, now discuss. We have plenty of time. Uh, so what I suggest we move to now is that I will move people into breakout groups. You can just spend five, seven minutes um, uh, raising some issues amongst a smaller group. Then we'll come back and we can um, uh, open the floor to a range of questions. So I'm going to open all the rooms now. Um, I learned from last week's breakout that if for some reason you find yourself left in a room alone, I can reallocate you. <laughs> 
this seems to have worked much better than before, which is great. Good. Okay. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, everybody managed um, to have a chat. I learned from last week that uh, if those that decide not to join a group, you can then move people. So some of you might have felt like you were picked up and thrown into another group. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, I don't have the capacity to ask uh, politely. Uh, so um, I hopefully everybody had a chance um, to have a chat and to discuss some of those issues. So what I want to do now, um, and I'm looking for Pratchy uh, uh, across a very busy gallery. Um, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> okay, good. So I've, I've, I've opened up the gallery, but of course I can only see so many people at one time. So my suggestion um, is that if you want to ask a question, could you just put an X in the chat? Uh, that way uh, I know who to ask um, and don't rely on the visual waving of hands because I might miss people. So um, would anybody like to start this process? What I suggest is I gather uh, um, three or four questions. We go back to Prachi. Um, she answers those and then we'll keep going until fatigue uh, <laughs> until so you're tired we'll, of hearing my voice we'll, yes. we'll move on so um yeah please don't be shy we're amongst friends here even though you are being broadcast uh, live on youtube Do you, do you want me to kick off? Uh, you don't follow instructions very well, do you, Tejendra? Uh, no. Just a couple of crosses in the chat would have been nice. But anyway, you carry on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Mario. Thanks, Prachi, for that very st stimulating um, presentation. Um, maybe this is a question that comes out of our discussion in the breakout room. Um, we were talking about um, um, some of the... Uh, creative and innovative educational responses that are happening um, at community levels in schools in you know different parts of the world um, which may not have been um, sort of considered in the whole process of uh, micro level sorry macro level educational planning and efforts to respond to this crisis right um, and, and you pointed out so grassroots level uh, knowledge production in terms of dealing with the, with the, with the crisis. Um, so I was thinking about my own experience of um, talking to a head teacher in a very rural school in, in Nepal where um, he was talking about the way that the government was encouraging um, schools uh, to, to facilitate teaching and learning using digital technologies and using radio and television and those were not particularly working because children were not really responding to those types of uh, you know modes of uh, pedagogical delivery um, whereas what they were trying to do is to bring children together on the school grounds because there's plenty of physical space where children can maintain uh, social distancing and teachers can actually deliver lessons on the on the school spaces outside the classrooms um, but then also there are other types of creative um, practices that might be happening at school levels which we don't know at the top level where uh, responses are being planned and policies are being promoted um, so could you talk a little bit about how we try to maximize those innovative practices at the local level and how we bring that knowledge together in order to benefit wider communities. So thank you, Tejander. I think that's a really, really good uh, point. And you know, this issue is one I think that's plagued um, our systems globally uh, for, 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 I mean, even pre-pandemic, right? Is how do we actually, I mean, I kind of hate that terminology, but it, it's used. How do you scale innovation? How do you actually scale good practice and infuse that within a system? And I think, you know, th there are there are issues in terms of firstly, 
what do we think about what is innovation? What does that actually mean? So when we're talking about innovation, is it new practice? Maybe um, is it the ability to bring different communities together, different stakeholders together, um, different sectors together? Maybe is it is it the idea that we want to focus on particular vulnerable and marginalized communities? Maybe right. There's there's and and also is is there something around the contours of that? practice or that program or that initiative that kind of um, has characteristics of innovation. And so these are like, you know, big questions that we have been trying to think about pre-pandemic. The urgency of trying to institute what we're seeing at the grassroots letter level to work um, has become paramount in terms of getting that into the into the planning community. And in certain um, systems, I would argue that actually my experience has been working, especially on the G20 work around this, my experience has been that what I've seen is that the G20 high income countries that have been relatively secure, the OECD countries that have been relatively secure educationally, are not as good as doing at doing this in terms of acting quickly and really understanding what's happening on the ground. We do not have the structures in place. We are not responsible, for example, to any other body like um, like, you know, you would have a PRSP back in the day, a poverty re reduction strategy plan, or you have to have, if you are a, a member country, if you are a country that's a recipient country from the Global Partnership for Education, you have to have a really strong education sector plan that actually looks at other sectors and works with other, other sectors. And there are bodies in place in these systems that help and facilitate planning. It's not perfect, of course, um, in, in, in every system, in every country, there are issues in terms of planning and implementation, but at least the structures are there. What was shocking to me, and it shouldn't really have been shocking, I don't know why it was shocking, but you know, I've spent the 20 odd, last 20 odd years not working on education in high income countries. I've spent my career working on education in low income, low middle income countries and conflict and emergency contexts. And for the first time in my life, I have really bothered to care about what's happening in Canada. I am originally can Canadian, but I didn't live here for a number, you know, for like, I don't know, 15 years and then I came back. And what I saw was a complete lack of real planning systems and also a lack of, of desire and cross-national system and to engage with countries from the global south, with low middle income countries, with countries that have been dealing with education exclusion for many, many years to learn those lessons. So when we talk about planning, there's of course the micro planning, which you wanna do at the local level. There will be a domestic level or there might be a one or two layers in between. There'll be a domestic or national level planning. And then we're talking about macro planning. And I haven't seen those roots or channels. If somebody else has, and if you have experience of that, please do bring it up because I would love to be able to learn more about this. Thanks, thanks a lot, Prachi. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to start with Yara Hilal. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Prachi, for this. Uh, I'm currently sitting in Lebanon at the moment in a highly conflict-inflicted area, and uh, one of the one of the thoughts that came um, through the discussion in the groups was, uh, you know, um, the COVID-19 has had has opened an opportunity for teacher agency uh, to surface, uh, for us to be able to see that uh, very clearly, especially here in, in, in the Global South in general, but particularly in Lebanon, where I'm currently residing. Um, one of the things is, of course, this is something I'm currently studying. I mean, how does that work within COVID-19? We've seen very, very fruitful grassroots uh, movements uh, building on uh, what has been said early, earlier. But one of the questions that came up, how do you sustain those uh, within, for example, the current educational system, uh, whether that is corrupt, 
uh, lacks agency, lack of governance, lack of accountability. H how can these actually sustain? Uh, you talked about institutionalization, which is great, but on the longer run and sustainability, how, how do we do that? Any thoughts there? Thank you. I mean, you know, these are big questions and they, they are, again, these, you know, what's fascinating to me is that the questions that are being posed vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic, at least in this uh, seminar right now, are questions that we've been dealing with and trying to answer um, in the broader literature for, for, for years. And that's partly why I say that, you know, I'm not an expert on, on, on all of these areas, but we do have a literature that examines this. Do we have some examples? Yes, we do have some examples where grassroots movements have actually been able to be institutionalized. That I think really depends on the localized context. It depends on the particular moment, the readiness of um, specific actors within those systems to capitalize on that. And many times change happens in a way that is led by particular actors that are sometimes cogs in a wheel. Do I have a more systematic answer to that question? I don't. But it's one of the problems that we've seen in terms of how do we actually engage the teacher agency? How do we view teachers and the knowledge and expertise and the solutions that they are implementing on the ground, not just as prevention, not just as professionals, but as agents of change and as agents of change within a system? Is there room for that in this context? Can we capitalize and take some small moments, some small openings into some of those planning cycles to be able to start instituting some of that. I am very much of the frame. I, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit, um, you know, uh, I come from the idea that uh, of new institutionalism. And my, my main kind of assumption is that change happens incrementally. There will, of course, be bursts of rebellion. There will be bursts of agency and change but when that happens, we need to capitalize on that and somehow institute that into, through a few willing actors into a system and that's how change happens. So that is at odds with the urgency and the scale of the emergency that we are seeing in education because of the uh, pandemic. I don't have any further answers to that, but I do see a tension there. Thanks, Prachi. Um, we have another couple of questions. I'm going to go uh, first to Poonam Sharma and then to Baran uh, Sengul. Um, so Poonam, uh, can you ask your question? Uh, yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. So uh, my question, uh, Professor Srivastav, is about the private entry that is um, uh, taking a more legitimate and a valid space, uh, especially in the low-income countries. How do we deal with that, given that we notice that academicians are writing to World Bank, still certain decisions are being made, Google is giving us plenty amount of money. So how do we deal with that? Hi, Poonam. Thanks for joining. Um, Yes, I mean, I think, you know, most of uh, people who are aware um, of my work know that actually the thing I actually do is study uh, non-state private engagement. And I have to remind myself that that is actually what I do. Um, the last uh, eight months have reoriented my focus. So your question is, is very well placed. Um, I think what we're seeing in terms of the pandemic and the entry, and I believe, Mario, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's going to be a, a topic, like a, a talk a little bit more around this, right, around different actors re-entering later on in the... Um, uh, next week, Tony Berger is talking about that's right. That's of, right. uh, education. Yeah. So, well, that's yeah. great. And Tony is Tony and I see uh, things uh, very much uh, eye to eye on on this. But I think I think one of the one of the um, issues that I've been seeing is that this is again an extension of what was happening pre pandemic. Just as um, just as change happens incrementally, and there are bursts and opportunities 
for kind of rebellious change. There are also bursts and opportunities for vested interests to capitalize and change systems. We usually think of change as being very positive, uh, associated with positive attributes, but there, are, there, there can be bursts of activities that allow actors or other interests to capitalize and, and, and promote change in a different way. And what we have seen over the last 20, 30 years consistently is that this change and this opening and this entry for non-state private engagement, non-state private actors, and particularly corporate actors, for-profit commercial actors has been happening incrementally in some countries more than others, in some areas more than others. And your point around Google and this kind of, it seems like there's a marrying of interest between the idea that, oh, you know, we don't really know how to reopen schools right now or systems right now. I, that's not the case in every context, but let's just take macro discourse. We don't really know how to do that right now. It's unsafe and we also don't know how to do it. That's that idea that we need all new evidence data knowledge and it's unsafe. So we need to think of distance education and remote learning. Now distance and remote learning are actual fields of study. There is literature on that. There are a number of initiatives, particularly coming from lower income and crisis afflicted contexts that do this in a very creative way. And it's not just a reductionist idea that we must put every child in front of a laptop in front of a screen. And yet the marrying of that interest with that discourse of certain corporate, um, I would say the corporate kind of hijacking of that has allowed some of that to flourish. There are, of course, yeah, you know, I'm not saying technology is bad. There are, of course, within the need for distance education through these IT um, modalities, there is always open source, nonprofit seeking, non-corporate, complete open access uh, technologies that we can use. But for example, uh, Mario and I are using Zoom. I'm using Zoom in my own in my own university, even though prior to the pandemic, we had a pretty good open source public platform that we used for teaching and learning. So the question really is about how the, some of that discourse level is capitalized and used either for change and rebellion in a way that we would like to see, or um, that builds on some of the incremental trends that we've been seeing that were worrying to us. Um, entering the pandemic. And the question is, where will it go, right? And, and how, what are, how is that, which part of those scenarios is gonna be further institutionalized? That's a longer term question. And I think actually Tony's presentation next week is probably going to help to answer some of those questions a little bit more. I mean, I don't know what his presentation will be, but I kind of know what he says. So I'm thinking along those lines. Thanks. I'm, I'm gonna hand over to Baran to ask his question. Oh, uh, sure, I, he's asking me to read it. So uh, thank you, Prachi. Um, my question will be based on the remarks you made about grassroots and policy-oriented research. Uh, what is your take on education research's response to the crisis against the backdrop of young people as prominent stakeholders and pupils being left out of knowledge production? Yeah. I'm asking this because as far as I'm concerned, a great deal of policy recommendations in recent research appeals to fail the principle of participation and therefore ignores the agency of young people. On the final note, how can education research collaborate with youth actors and emphasize their agency in this crisis? Thank you, uh, that's a great question. Thank you so much for raising it. Um, yes, again, uh, another theme that was, you know, pretty starting to gain a lot of traction uh, before this pandemic a little bit more recently, I would say that uh, youth participation and the need in terms of mobilizing youth action um, in education, in, in what is the fundamental kind of sphere, one of the most fundamental spheres of their lives, is an area of scholarship and policy mobilization that has really been taking off in the last, I would say, 10 years. But this question leads us to the idea of the silent 
you know, I don't want to say victims because that's really the not how I want to see young people being positioned. But the way that we position young people and children in education systems is exactly what we should not be doing in the sense of if we even look at our own uh, education uh, research and we look at the kinds of research that is usually done, the voices of children and youth, the, their actual lived experiences in education and schooling, the proportion of research that's actually focused on doing that is quite a, a lot less than we should have. There are now new studies that are coming out, but you know, for example, Young Lives is one of, I would say, one of like one of the big studies that tried to focus on the children, the youth, and look at that longitudinally. It's one of these studies that has actually also come out with different kinds of ways of engaging with children and being able to include them in much more participatory uh, models of research. I don't think we've done that particularly well. I don't think we've done that particularly systematically. And I don't think we're doing that now. We are seeing in some countries, pockets of youth getting together to protest and to protest um, what they think is a flagrant disregard of their ability to access education in the context of the pandemic. I have seen some youth and children march and organize marches and say that you are not taking our circumstances seriously, that the systems are not reopening in a way that takes into consideration what we need. These right now are fragmented. I was just thinking the other day, like yesterday actually, how in five to 10 years, when those children become young adults and youth, we are going to have a lot to pay for because what we are doing right now globally in terms of securing that right to education through this pandemic is simply insufficient. And already I'm seeing the discourse of the fact that aid will be strapped, that domestic budgets will be strapped, that there are other priorities, that those priorities will take precedence and that actually we must continue on the idea that there are scarce resources for education, that there always have been, and that those will now become scarcer. So your comment around young people, um, it's to me one of the fundamental issues, and yet we have not done that, and we continue not to do that in a systematic way. Um, but I think there must be grassroots um, organizations that are trying to bring that up. It's just how do we amplify that? How do we show how we can move forward by having some of that um, participation in more than just lip service? Um, thanks, Prachi. Um, I'm going to ask a question myself as there's not anyone in the chat. I just wanted to raise a couple of uh, issues, um, political economy issues really, around um, the competing interests in this debate um, and, and, and reflect a bit on an example. So last night um, uh, on Twitter came uh, uh, a discussion around um, Bristol University Student Union, which is coming out very hard on more and more face-to-face -face teaching in the universities and pushing for that. And UCU, our own lecturers trade union, which is increasingly um, arguing for us not to do face to face teaching and to online. And so I think it's about a reflection on competing issues around human rights, uh, the right to education um, versus the right to safety, uh, to protection and how we how we manage those issues. Um, and you know how we deal with those and 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 come out the other side in a progressive way. Um, and similarly, I think about issues around temporality, you know, short term versus long term. So, for example, you know, you know, coming back to the discussion within the UK within universities, um, our union has a position of very much going online, and that. Um, the argument that we try to deal with is 
basically that vice chancellors are saying that, um, you know, if we don't teach face to face, we're threatening the mental health of students and that we need to support them. And the argument from UCU then becomes that uh, by uh, teaching online, we can provide a much better quality product, right? Now, I think that in the short term, that may work, but in the long term, we're in danger of becoming the, um, uh, the midwife of uh, high tech technology that actually as unionists, we've been fighting against because we were afraid. So there is there are challenges here around responses and short term versus long term uh, issues that I think we need to raise and to reflect on and balance out. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm completely with you. And, you know, I do think that we need to be mindful of, of you know, as so just speaking as as a professor and, you know, on kind of both sides of the story, it's like we also need to be mindful of those competing rights as well. There is a right to a safe work environment. There is a right, you know, we, we do have those rights. Um, but there's also the idea of thinking about how do we see this in my mind as like a transition period? And what parts of this transition do we want to keep? And, you know, there is room for innovation. There's room for creativity. There's room for doing things differently and for, and really for doing and doing them differently for the right reasons. Um, and there is room for that. And, you know, my, my, my hope is that those are the things that we actually take away. You know, it's like a sieve, right? You want to be when, when at the end of it, you want to keep the good stuff. In, in this case, you want to keep the good stuff in the sieve. And, and, and what you want to be able to do is when we think that there's some level of more of a reopening, a more sustainable reopening, I don't use the term post-pandemic because I don't really know what that means. And yeah, I don't know. But when there's more of a context to support a sustainable reopening, how do we do that? Keeping in mind the questions of equity, keeping in mind the questions of competing interests, of commercialization, what does that mean for us in terms of higher education? I'm speaking right now in higher education. What does that mean in terms of higher education? Are we gonna be seen as deliverers of recorded lectures or are we gonna be seen as people who create and co-create knowledge with in, through the practice of higher education and by engaging with our students and by engaging with our uh, re research and by engaging with our colleagues. So I'm fully with you. I, I think it's, it's, you know, I think it's a very, you know, on the one hand, it's a very exciting time on the one hand. And on the other hand, it's really scary because you see all of these very um, problematic, um, you know, problematic kind of trends that, that are either going to be intensified, parts of those are going to be intensified, and maybe some of it will have backlash, but I don't really know how that's going to work out. So I think we just, we need to be very much more mindful about how we are going to direct. As people working in the higher education system, we need to think about how we're going to direct that change and how we can see if there's room for that in our institutions. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and that question is coming from your guest, Jadhav. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, uh, hello, Dr. Prachi, uh, this hey, is Yogesh. Okay. Hi. So, so my question basically is that uh, as we were talking in the group, uh, like in India, for example, like the question has always been between access and quality. Like, uh, you know, government has been claiming that we have 99 to close to 100 percent access in schools. But the quality has been in terms of outcomes has been lagging. So now schools have been closed for the last six months. You know, children are not going to school, not accessing any other services. How do you think that this whole exclusion part of it is, is just going to be addressed? Because now the children are suddenly uh, behind, you know, by, by six months and, you know, even more because now they have not had any access to, to education and we've been ob already grappling with these issues. And my second question was about like uh, after every great uh, crisis, I mean, this may be a general uh, Remark, but uh, after every great crisis in the world, maybe it was Spanish flu or, or the Great Depression of the 30s, the world made some sort of an ex exponential sort of progress, you know, like new things came, innovations came. So can we expect that 
can we look at certain ideas where where we can actually help these children from the low income countries or 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 you know like developing countries to actually leapfrog all those thought processes which have been designed keeping in mind a, a physical classroom or a teacher in place or a facility in place can we actually think of give them an opportunity to actually you know do do something new and you know approach them in a different manner thank you Thank you, Yogesh. Um, Yogesh is actually my master's student. He's working with me. He's based in India right now because he wasn't able to come to Western <laughs> because of the pandemic. So lovely to see you. Um, yeah, your, your comments about India. So, you know, the issue with India is, of course, you know, if we just think of the demographic issue, it's huge, right? It's huge that, firstly, the question around access in India in, in terms of the pandemic, it's differentiated action it's differentiated access and the act that differentiation has been highlighted by orders of magnitude because of the pandemic so some of the you know the really high fee private schools in india they are continuing with education and they're continuing in a way that is pretty phenomenal i mean i've seen some of what's happening there and it's pretty incredible what they're doing but then they're serving a very small minority of students from a very particular social class background and it's again within the context of increasing privatization that has been happening in terms of the broader education system for the last 20 years in india so the differentiated access part is what is going to be i think in many 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 contexts including the more quote unquote educationally secure high income context, but the orders of magnitude are going to be much less there. The different, the pattern of differentiated access is going to plague us. And that is what is going to cause the, the, I don't want to be alarmist, but I do see this as being a crisis that we are really not going to understand the full effects of for at least you know, uh, in the next 10 to 15 years, we're really not going to understand. And that's going back to literature coming out of the Second World War, when they actually tracked the life opportunities of people and how they were, how they were affected by the war and how long it took for people to be able to recover income and means and all of this, right. So it's thinking about that. Now, in a context of India, the, the, the magnitude of what we're talking about population has a huge impact on the world order as well, especially given how um, the economies and the macroeconomic connections between countries have changed over the last 20 years. And what's really um, problematic there also is the broader uh, impact of that on our global um, societies on the global economies over the next 20 years. Do I think that there is an opportunity to leapfrog some of those? Yes, I do. Um, I, but I think, again, as we've talked a lot in today's session, this idea of how we capitalize on the, the true innovation, for me, innovation isn't just glossy and shiny, fun technology. I mean, that could be part of it. The true innovation is how do we reach the most marginalized in ways that are sustainable and that actually allow them uh, to access life opportunities in a way that will enable better life chances throughout their exist, you know, for their existence throughout their lives. That to me is innovation. How do we do that? How do we do that at a systems level? So yes, there might be some innovations or practices, so new practices that are potentially, that ha potentially have that opportunity. The issue is, again, as we've talked throughout, how do we identify them? How do we capitalize the little mini bursts of rebellion, positive rebellion that are happening in our systems and bring them into the planning process so that they are institutionalized through those actors that are willing and able to propagate that change. At the end of the day, systems, all systems, including education systems, are run and designed and managed and thought about by us, by human beings, by people, by individual actors. I was no, I was reminded of that most specifically when I used to work for the UN mission and I realized what a small cog I was in this huge machinery, but what one small cog could actually do. So the question is, how do we identify those people in those systems, the individual actors in those systems, and bring them to the point where we connect with that, 
when then we're able to maximize change. I think that's incremental, but I think the moment, the window is now. I think that's a very nice moment to finish on. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, Prachi, for a really stimulating uh, presentation and also really good um, and reflective uh, answers to many of the questions uh, and points raised. Um, and thanks to all of the audience uh, for taking time out of your busy timetables um, to join us. Just to say that this link that you have for the Zoom is good for every session throughout. Uh, even if you haven't registered, you can join um, the rest of the peer uh, series. Um, next week's lecture uh, is uh, same time, same place. Uh, the political economy of education privatization in times of crisis. Uh, and that will be from colleagues uh, and friends from the University, uh, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, uh, Anthony Verger and Clara von de Villa. Um, another great session um, for you all. Uh, please put that in your diary and I look forward to seeing uh, everyone uh, next week. Uh, thanks a lot and take care. Signing out. Thank you everyone. Bye. Are, Mario, are we um, staying on here or?